Good evening, everyone. We'll go ahead and call to order the County Planning Commission for January 8th, uh, 2024. Will you please call the roll? Yes, members Bor uh, Borja, Devlin, Rathel, here. Tatishi, here. And Corona Savignano, here. And we do have our quorum. If you'll please stand with me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. If you'll please make the announcements for this evening. Yes, the county fosters public engagement during the meeting and encourages public participation, civility, and use of courteous language. To make a public comment, please complete a speaker request form and add it to the clerk. That would be me, and the chairperson will call your name when it's your turn to make a comment. To make a teleconference public comment, please dial 916-875-2500 and follow the prompts for instructions. Refer to the agenda and listen to the live meeting to determine when is the best time to call to be placed in queue for a specific agenda item or off agenda matter. Callers may be on hold for up to an extended period of time and should plan accordingly. When the chairperson opens public comment for a specific agenda item or off agenda matter, callers will be transferred from the queue into the meeting to make a verbal comment. Each agenda item queue will remain open until the public comment period is closed for that specific item. The time limit as set by the chair will be two minutes and it is the same, um, it will be the same as in-person comments. You may also feel free to send a written comment to board clerk at sackcounty.gov and your comment will be routed to the board and filed in the record. And if you'll please call item number one. And your item number one this evening is for a tentative subdivision map, use permit, special development permit, and design review located at 4904 Manzanita Avenue at the northeast corner of Manzanita Avenue and Bourbon Drive in the Carmichael Old Foothill Farms community. And the environmental document is a mitigated negative declaration. Metro, can you bring up the presentation for item number one, please? I don't see an option over here to control it, so normally I can toggle it on and off. Testing? Oh, there we go. Okay. Let's start this again. Uh, good evening, Chair Rathel, Commissioners. I'm David Olrieros, Associate Planner, the planner assigned to the Verde Cruz at Manzanita Hills Project, which is a 17-unit attached single-family home development. You may recall this development from the September 11th, 2023 Planning Commission meeting at which the project was initially heard. Due to Commissioner questions related to traffic and circulation, the project was continued to allow staff to work with DOT and County Engineering to fully respond. Before we dive into follow-up from staff's research, I will provide a brief overview. The project is located at 4904 Manzanita Avenue at the northeastern corner of Manzanita Avenue and Bourbon Drive within the Carmichael and Old Foothill Farms community. Zoning of the property is RD10 or residential 10, which allows for up to 10 dwelling units per acre. And a portion is within the natural streams combining zone district. The project as proposed is consistent with the maximum density permitted by the residential 10 zoning district. However, a use permit is required to allow greater than 10 attached single family residential units and for development within the natural streams combining zone. A tentative subdivision map is requested to allow for the creation of 17 lots, allowing for each proposed unit to have their own ownership. It is important to note that the common lots and private drive will be owned and maintained by the proposed HOA. A special development permit to allow deviations from minimum interior lot area, minimum corner lot width, public street frontage, minimum front yard setback, minimum interior yard setback, and minimum rear yard setback is also requested. The bulk of these deviations are requested in order to maintain consistency with the minimum number of units identified for the site by the housing element, housing elements vacant land inventory, which for the site is 17 units and meet density requirements for transit adjacency, which is a minimum of 10 dwelling units per acre in this context, while respecting the required setback from Verde Cruz Creek. 
Lastly, a design review is requested to determine substantial compliance with the countywide design guidelines. During the initial hearing of the project by the Planning Commission on September 11th, 2023, a number of questions were asked related to parking, traffic, and circulation. The first question was whether parking would be permitted on both sides of Bourbon Drive, with a public commenter expressing concern that allowing parking on both sides would result in vehicles not being able to pass one another. County Engineering has conditioned that street improvements on Bourbon be based on a 54-foot collector, which would have vehicle parking on both sides of the street. Based on that, this, based on the standard parking stall width being nine feet in, in width, with parking on both sides of the street, 36 feet would remain for vehicles to pass one another. Another question received was the reasoning for a traffic signal not being required. Staff has worked with DOT, who has evaluated the intersection and concluded that the vehicle counts, including the vehicle trips generated from the project, do not meet the minimum thresholds for the requirement of a traffic signal. And further, that because of the left-in, right-in, right-out configuration of the intersection, oper operational and or safety issues would not be anticipated at the intersection. Additionally, DOT noted of the potential of the installation of a traffic signal at the subject intersection to cause additional cut-through traffic through the neighborhood uh, for vehicles attempting to bypass the Madison and Manzanita intersection. So here we have the proposed the subdivision map. Here we have the proposed site plan reflecting the 54-foot collector previously mentioned, as well as the attached sidewalk along Bourbon Drive and separated sidewalk along Manzanita Avenue. As currently existing, there are no sidewalk improvements along the property's frontage, so the proposed street improvements would be continuing the pedestrian network along a current gap in that network. Here we have the proposed landscape plan. Each residence will have their own rear yard area, and future owners will be responsible for the landscaping of those rear yard areas. Here are the proposed elevations, which utilize a Mediterranean style of architecture. And with that, staff does continue to recommend approval of the project and recommend that the Planning Commission determine the environmental analysis is adequate and complete, adopt the mitigation monitoring and reporting program, approve the tentative subdivision map, use permit, and special development permit subject to the findings and conditions as contained in attachment two, and find the project in substantial compliance with the countywide design guidelines. And that concludes my presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions the commission may have. We are also joined by Maria, Maria Wong of Wong & Associates, representing the applicant team, as well as DOT for questions related to traffic. Thank you. Questions for staff this evening? I have a, um, so thank you for uh, the presentation and thank you for the information on the uh, traffic. Um, in regards to the parking, so I understand that you can park and there'll still be room for cars to go through and forward. Um, my experience with uh, Bourbon Drive has been there have been extended parking vehicles, meaning vehicles that park there longer than normally 72 hours. Um, will there be any kind of enforcement to ensure that, um, I'll say just these, they're not necessarily abandoned, but they're definitely not utilized vehicles on the regular or are being managed as we're adding more. Because I, I mean, I wasn't sure how many uh, visitor sites are parking or is it just truly in the parking um, in front of the garages that is for visitors to park in, on the site? So there's eight guest parking stalls on uh, within the site and then the street frontage um, parking on Bourbon um, for people... Are you asking on Bourbon specifically? Well, yeah, or? because I mean, if, if, if people are going to be visiting on a weekend or something of the sort, uh, their friends, families, colleagues, whatever, uh, at the property there, uh, if, they're, if we're assuming that because Bourbon has overflow parking that, that we can meet those standards, my question is, is that um, my experience driving along Bourbon has been that there have been vehicles that have been parked there for weeks uh, on end without movement. And so um, if that's the case, is there really truly going to be enough parking uh, available to guests who would be uh, coming onto that property? Yeah, so just to clarify, uh, the on-street parking is not required for this project. Um, it does satisfy the minimum guest parking requirement um, and has minimum um, two stalls per residence for uh, general parking. So it does satisfy that requirement within the site. Any additional parking on the street would be um, helpful for the community 
um, in terms of parking, other neighbors could utilize that, as well as if there were to exceed uh, the number of uh, stalls in any, in any case, this project, um, it would accommodate that. Okay, and then uh, for the traffic study, I mean, did they actually do a car count uh, along Bourbon uh, towards Manzanita and from Manzanita towards Bourbon, or what, is it an estimate? So that I would defer to DOT. They do have their methods for how they calculate the number of trips generated. Um, and I believe we have Gary Gasparri in attendance who may be able to shed some light on that. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I am vertically challenged. It's OK. Thank you. Good evening, Planning Commission. So part of how we analyze if when new trips get generated is we use a manual called the ITE uh, Transportation Manual, so Institute of Transportation Engineers, and they take similar buildings from data all across the U.S., and they could determine based on how many units D-17 would produce. Uh, typically, what we would look at is they would produce 124 new daily trips, so that's cars arriving and leaving. But the uh, worst case we usually look at, too, is the uh, PM hour, was when people are commuting. And during the PM peak hour, uh, for that evening, we look between 4 and 7 PM, and that peak hour, the main peak hour, would produce 10 new trips on that roadway. So already looking at that, if you had 10 PM peak trips on that road, that's about one extra car every six uh, minutes during the peak hour. So we wouldn't see that as a significant impact. Our typical thresholds are to look at a project to study is if it exceeds 1,000 daily trips or 100 uh, peak hour trips. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Quick, quick question uh, while you're up here. So I'm not as familiar with the area, but when it's conditioned uh, for the improvements, right now Bourbon is not improved in front of this project. So the widening would happen with this project. Is that correct? So that, That's correct, yes. And to further elaborate on that too, uh, staff believes that with the improvement of Bourbon, it might get rid of some of that long-term abandoned vehicle type situation with it being more improved and... Um, it's less of a no man's land, so to say. Understood. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions for staff this evening? All right. Uh, at this time, we'd like to invite the applicant up. And we can get you sworn in. Um, if there's multiple folks on your team here this evening, we get them all sworn in at once if they're going to answer any questions. Give the commission is the truth, so help you God. If you do not swear, do you so affirm? I do. If you could please state your name for the record. Maria Wong. And make the statement, I have been sworn. I have been sworn. And sir, if you could do the same. Your name? Okay. Nick and make the statement I have been sworn. Yep. Thank you, sir. Okay. Good evening, commissioners. We're happy to be back. Um, it's been a very long process, as you can tell, from all the material before you and the discussion that we had the last time that we were here. And um, we want to thank staff for taking the time to clarify the questions that you had. Um, I, at this point, I don't have anything to add. Um, we. Um, think we have a great project. We think it's going to be an asset for the Carmichael community. Um, a lot of the things that have been presented throughout the course of um, deliberations and working through the design for the project are th things that are um, being dealt with countywide. So um, we hope that, that this is a project that you can support and we look forward to building it. Thank you. And I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you so much. Uh, questions for the applicant team this evening? Thank you. All right, with that, we'll move on to public comment. And there are no public comments. And we'll go ahead and close public comment and move on to deliberation. So I had um, the questions, I think, at the last Planning Commission meeting regarding the traffic and uh, based on what county has uh, reported and responded with, especially, I think, the widening and improvements along Bourbon, I can support the project. So I would make a motion to uh, adopt and approve staff recommendations. 
Thank you. Do I have a second for staff recommendation? Second. All right. We have a motion and a second. Any further comments or discussion before we call for a vote? All right, will you please call the roll? Yes. Members, uh, Rathel? Yes. Corona Savignano? Yes. Tatishi? Yes. And Devlin? Yes. And the motion carries with those members present. Thank you so much. Will you please call item number two? And your item number two this evening is for a use permit, special development permit and design review. And it's located at 7599 Stockton Boulevard in the South Sacramento community. And the environmental document is a mitigated negative declaration. All right, good evening. My name is Emma Patton, senior planner, and I'll be presenting the Stockton and Gerber 76 service station for you this evening. Uh, you may recognize this project from the March 27th, 2023 Planning Commission meeting where this item was continued. The project site is located at the corner of Stockton and Gerber Road in the South Sacramento community. The project site is currently vacant. The project site is zoned light commercial and is surrounded by apartments to the north and to the east. There's an existing service station to the south. And then to the west is a mix of uses, including a auto dismantler and a residential care facility. During the course of this application, the applicant provided a variety of site configurations, including configurations with the convenience store building closer to the street and configurations with the convenience store behind the fuel canopy. During the March 27th, 2023 Planning Commission meeting, commissioners noted a preference for earlier versions of the proposed development that consisted of the convenience store being located closer to the street. So on this exhibit, you'll see the November 2021 version had that convenience store closer to the street, and the January 2022 version is the version that was presented to the Planning Commission during that May 27th, 2023 uh, Planning Commission meeting. So in response to the direction provided by the Planning Commission, the applicants requested that the item be continued during that meeting to allow them the opportunity to revise the project to respond to those concerns. So now uh, at the, on the furthest right, you'll see the current configuration, once again with the convenience store pushed towards the corner of Stockton and Gerber. The requested entitlements remain generally consistent as those considered during the March 2023 Planning Commission meeting and include a use permit, a special development permit, and a design review. Uh, however, the deviations being requested through the special development permit are different as the proposed convenience store is located closer to the corner of Stockton and Gerber. So specifically, uh, the revision requires a special development permit to reduce the minimum front yard setbacks, a deviation not previously requested. I'll also note that the applicant continues to request a public convenience or necessity or PCN letter to sell alcoholic beverages at the convenience store. The Planning Commission is not responsible for making a recommendation related to the PCN request. Uh, instead, it will be heard by the board concurrently with the subject application following the Planning Commission's recommendation on the use permit, the special development permit, and the design review. So here you can see the proposed site plan and landscaping featuring the convenience store at the corner and the fuel canopy behind. In addition to discussing the site design during the March 2023 meeting, uh, the planning commissioners also shared concerns regarding the over concentration of gas stations. Uh, while acknowledging the presence of other fueling stations in the area, the applicant noted that the site would have both electrical vehicle chargers on site and healthy food options in the convenience store, both of which they argued were in limited supply in the area. Uh, at the time, the plans for EV charging were minimal, with only two EV charging stations planned to be installed. But following the Planning Commission meeting, the applicant revised their development plans to include a more robust EV, app, EV charging strategy. This includes one level two EV charging station, two level three EV charging stations, and then infrastructure under the fuel canopy to one day allow for the conversion from, of the gas pumps to level three charging stations. Here you can see the proposed elevations of the convenience store building. This would be the 
more prominent feature of the site with it being at the corner of Stockton and Gerber Boulevard, or Gerber Road, excuse me, access to the convenience store would be available from both the parking area and the street. An initial study mitigated negative declaration was prepared for this project, which addresses air quality, noise, biological resources, and cultural resources, amongst other resource areas. The project would result in less than significant impacts with the implementation of mitigation measures. Those measures are included in the mitigation monitoring and reporting program. This project was considered by the South Sacramento CPAC in November 2021. During that meeting, they recommended that the board deny the requested entitlements, noting concerns uh, of overconcentration of gas stations. And they also noted that there were some potential nuisance concerns for the adjacent apartment complex. In August 2023, after the applicant had revised their development plans, staff did bring this project back to the CPAC to notify, notify them of those revisions. During that meeting, the CPAC noted that the changes to the site design did not resolve their concerns as initially provided. Uh, they ultimately did not provide a vote during that meeting as it was uh, brought to them as a informational item. The project was also brought to the Design Review Advisory Committee on August 24th, 2023, following the revisions. During that meeting, the DRAC noted that the latest version of the plans uh, was the superior option and complemented efforts to improve site circulation, improve the convenience store's streetscape presence, and consider the future use of the site with the option to remove the fuel canopy and replace with EV chargers. The proposed use is consistent with the general plan and community plan. Uh, with approval of the special development permit, the proposed development is consistent with the zoning code use and development standards. The proposed development is compatible with the surrounding uses as conditioned. The project would result in less than significant impacts with the application of mitigation measures, and the project can be found consistent with the countywide design guidelines. So based on this analysis, uh, staff is recommending approval of the request, uh, specifically that the board determine the, or specifically that uh, the board determine the environmental analysis prepared for the project is adequate and complete, that the board adopt the MMRP, approve the use permit, approve the special development permit, and find the project in substantial compliance with the design guidelines. Uh, this evening, you'll be providing your recommendation to the Board of Supervisors. Uh, that concludes my presentation. I am joined this evening by the applicant team, um, and both of us are available with any questions. Thank you. Questions for staff this evening? Thank you for the presentation. Um, can you talk a little bit about, or I don't know if this is for the applicant, um, in terms of the MOU that has to be entered for the Healthy Stores Initiative, how does that work? And then who will be, is there a role for the county to assess whether that 15% of healthy foods is met? Yeah, so you're, you're referring to conditions 18 and 19 of attachment to, so, that those conditions require the applicant to enter into a memorandum of understanding with the Health Education Council, um, and that will that, that Health Education Council will be responsible for reviewing that memorandum of understanding that the applicant enters into, and confirming that they meet those minimum 15% um, shelf space for healthy foods, and they have a list of what qualifies as healthy foods. Okay. Do you know if that's a one-time determination or ongoing? My understanding is, is it's a one, at one time that they enter into the memorandum of understanding, but in terms of compliance, it's ongoing, and so they will need okay. to demonstrate compliance with that 15% requirement on an ongoing basis. Okay, thank you. And then in terms of um, infrastructure, the EV infrastructure underneath the gas pumps, is there other models like that um, around the county? Have we seen success with that? I mean, none of them have really converted yet, but. Just yeah, wondering. I, I, I am not familiar with any other okay. models in the county where we have uh, fuel canopies being constructed with the infrastructure to transition into EV charging stations. Um, to my knowledge, this is the um, first proposal for something of that sort. Uh, the applicant team may be aware of other uh, models in other areas of, of the state. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Were you able to look at um, or evaluate rather as part of the um, uh, impacts the noise associated from the commercial car wash? 
Yes, there was a noise study prepared, um, and from that noise study, uh, we did apply some mitigation measures uh, specific to noise. Um, those mitigation measures are included in both the MMRP and the condition document. In the condition document, it's condition 21, um, and it relates to uh, pr providing some sound absorptive treatments, uh, blocking the, the hood of the, the car wash to make sure that it uh, screens the, the dryer blower fans, and then also providing the eight foot tall CMU wall that travels along the northern and eastern boundaries of the site. Um, based on those, uh, noise should be uh, reduced to levels that are out allowed per our general plan. Thank you. Any other questions for staff? All right, thank you, Ms. Patton. Thank you. And at this time, we'll invite the applicant uh, or the applicant team up. If we've got multiple folks answering questions, we'll get you all sworn in at once. Uh, I'm Melvin Higginbotham, the architect and applicant on the project. We'll get you sworn in real quick. Um, and this is Diane Kinderman with Abbott and Kinderman, representing our, our council. Uh, Brian Holloway uh, is with, with their firm, and then Sandeep Donda is the property owner. Perfect. Now, if I can just get you sworn in, if you could please raise your right hand. Any appropriate responses, I do. Do you swear that the testimony you're about to give this commission is the truth? And if you do not swear, so help you God, do you, if you do not swear, do you so affirm? I do affirm. And then you have stated your names for the record, and if you could just make the statements, and you as well, Diane. I do affirm. Thank you. Thank you. And, if you can make the statement, I have been sworn. Oh, I do affirm. Okay, thank you. Go ahead, please. Okay. Thank you, Emma. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, I, I have basically three sections of thought tonight. It's history, highlights, and observations for the project. Uh, Emma did a very good job presenting the history of the project and uh, what it took to get to where we are. I would just like to say with regard to history, that you know, when you go through this, it's always painful while you're going through it, and there's a lot of back and forth, but I can honestly say at this point that we are grateful for all of the feedback and observations that we have received and the guidance we received from planning staff uh, over this time, and, and from the CPAC, and the members of the CPAC, and the members of the DRAC, and also from you, the Planning Commission. Uh, we believe that this has brought us to what we consider to be a more superior project than what we had presented in the beginning, and we are proud of it. Uh, I would like to say that uh, the highlights as I see them, and I'm just starting from, from what I observe on the project. When I look at it, I look at the uh, perspective from the corner of the project. I, I see a well-defined and improved street frontage. Uh, we have all new uh, sidewalks, uh, accessible sidewalks with uh, sidewalks that cross driveways with new driveway approaches, new curb ramps on the corner that are accessible, accessible crosswalks in the street, a new stoplight. We have new trees along the uh, frontage. And we have what we consider to be a, a beautiful pedestrian friendly building. Uh, on the corner, fronting on both streets. And uh, that's what I see as the, uh, the, the well-defined street frontage. And I, I, I think it will be a beautiful sight when you, when you look at it. Uh, the other thing I see is the neighborhood market. Uh, we have increased the size of this market to 3,500 square feet, increasing it 500 square feet from our original thought of 3,000. Uh, in that square footage, uh, we will include and the healthy food offerings, and we're we're committed to pr to providing. And, I, and I'm glad that uh, Commissioner, you asked the question about it. We're we're looking forward to presenting at least the minimum requirement of 15% uh, of, of shelf space. Uh, we're hopeful that it will be you know it could be more, but we're we're presenting healthy food offerings uh, to uh, our customers. Um, and these, these offerings will be compliant with programs such as the Supplemental Nutritional Program, the SNAP Program, WIC, and, and the others that were mentioned tonight. 
uh, we're, we're proud of that, and, and we don't want to skirt that issue. We're looking forward to it. We also are proud of the fact that we're going to be able to provide some staple food offerings like milk, bread, eggs, butter, et cetera. And, um, and I would say that one of the things that I'm most proud of is that this market will be accessible to, and I don't know if, if we have the, we probably don't have the exhibit of the neighborhood, right? But, but if you were on the corner, and, and, and I, I, I think you're familiar with it, if you look behind our project, there's probably a square mile of single family residence and uh, multifamily apartment buildings that are right behind our, our, our project. We are hopeful that, that or well, what we know is that all of these people in this neighborhood could access our market uh, by walking or riding a bike, and they don't have to cross a major intersection to get there. So we think that's a, that's a good observation. Um, the next thing that I would say that we're, we're very proud of that's a result of all this back and forth is the electric vehicle charging. Now, I, based on feedback that I received on uh, some of the questions from planning commissioners and such, um, I, I engaged our electrical engineer to do a preliminary one-line diagram for us on what, what will this actually look like. Because we don't know of any other model out there where somebody's doing what we're doing. I've only heard of one other project farther up north, and they're just in the thought process stage right now. But the, the electrical engineer provided us with a preliminary one-line diagram, giving us the size of the switch gear that goes in our, you know, well, the size of the switch gear, and also the size and quantities of the electric transformers that are required. So we, and, and we have looked at our project, we have confirmed that we can house all of these facilities. So I feel much better about that. We have accurate knowledge now of, of what it's gonna take, and we have confirmed that we can handle it. Um, the um, uh, initially, uh, it's going to be in, in basically two stages for the, for this EV charging. Initially, our initial design will include transformer and switch gear uh, that will accommodate not only the facility but also two level three chargers and one level two charger. We have the infrastructure; we will have the infrastructure in place to then add two more level three chargers without having to change any of that electrical equipment. So we could upgrade two more. We don't have to change the switch gear. We just have to, you know, bring in the wire, set the, you know, set the, the panel and such to make it happen. But the transformer that we have initially will accommodate that. Looking down the road, when we do begin to, um, uh, to change out the fuel pumps with electric vehicle charging, at that point, we will need to add a, another, a second or another transformer and then that transformer will then, and, and switch gear that, that uh, will be able to accommodate the full upgrade of all five um, fuel pumps, uh, 10, 10 fueling stations. So this, this in the end, this, this um, project will have, um, uh, what I say, 15, I mean as many as 15 electric vehicle charging stations. And, and uh, we believe that all of those but one will be level three. Uh, so we're, we're very excited about this. Um, Brian Holloway uh, uh, pointed out at one point that uh, he observed that the, the charging stations will be particularly valuable to the neighborhood behind us because they are level three. People who live in the apartment complexes or even the homes that don't have the ability to charge their vehicles at their home can come over, charge their vehicles, they can walk back home, walk back to the station and pick it up and go. I mean, it's convenient for them. So we're excited about that. And I would say those are, are probably the, um, the, high, the observations that we have are the, the food offerings to the neighborhood and the electric vehicle charging to the neighborhood. Yes, it is a gas station, but we think it's so much more than a gas station. It's, it's a trend-setting plan for how we can, we can go forward. And we also see that this project, with this infrastructure that we put in place for EVC charging, uh, it puts it on track for the uh, SMUDS 2030 net zero um, carbon plan that we're excited about. So thank you so much for listening to this, and thank you for considering our project. So we're here if you have any questions for us. 
Thank you, Mr. Higginbotham. Uh, questions for the applicant this evening? Thank you. All right, with that, we'll move on to public comment. And, um, there are no public comments. All right, we'll close public comment. Anyone want to kick us off this evening? I'll go ahead and, go ahead and move the staff recommendation for approval of the project. Okay. Um, I just want to disclose that I did meet with the applicant before the, um, before the hearing, but I would second that motion. I also want to disclose that I did meet with the applicant and really do appreciate all the changes that have been made to, to this project. I think um, uh, it's very you know forward thinking and I think that it's gonna place this project in, in a great position for when should we get to that transition of moving from fossil fuel to electric vehicles. However, I still remain concerned with just deciding the, uh, the location of the gas station next to um, the apartment complexes, the homes that are right next to it. I think also I'm concerned about the, you know, the, I appreciate the healthy food, but I also am concerned of like the reliance on a gas station to provide that healthy food in an area that needs it um, so much. So I, for me, I just, I guess I don't, I still don't feel comfortable that this is the right place for a gas station given the over-concentration of other gas stations in the area. But I do appreciate you meeting with me and the changes that you went through for this project. All right, I'll add in my thoughts also. I'll disclose that I met with the applicant team again on this project, as it's been a, a long process. Uh, and um, I appreciate the larger um, food market that's there, and I appreciate uh, the look forward and trying to build something uh, for the long term. Um, definitely a, a much bigger fan of the walkability um, of this project as opposed to the one that we first saw at Planning Commission, which was that middle version. So uh, with with all the changes that have been made, I can support the, the project and make the, that recommendation um, to the board. Any further comments before I call for a vote? Oh, I would like to disclose I did meet with the applicant prior to. Sounds good. All right, will you please call the roll? Okay, Commissioners Rathel. Yes. Corona Sabignano? No. Tatishi? Yes. And Devlin? Yes. And the motion carries. Thank you. Uh, please call item number three. And your item number three this evening is for a general plan amendment. Uh, East Antelope specific plan amendment, a rezone, large lot tentative parcel map, small lot tentative subdivision map, and design review. And um, it is located at 7907 Antelope North Road in the Antelope community, and the environmental document is an addendum to final environmental impact report. And Metro, can you please cue up the presentation for item number three? Alrighty. Good evening, Commissioners. Chair Rathel, I was hoping we would have a laser pointer this evening, but we don't, so bear with me in my descriptions. Um, I am Emma Carrico, Associate Planner and Project Manager for the Antelope North Subdivision Project. Next slide, please. Oh, yeah. The project site is a 40.5 acre parcel located at 7907 Antelope North Road. The parcel is currently undeveloped and is characterized by non-native grassland and eucalyptus trees. There is a seasonal creek along the western portion of the site. The parcel has a general plan land use designations of low density residential and medium density residential. It is located within the East Antelope specific plan area which provides a land use designation of urban residential. The zoning includes residential seven, residential 20, and open space. Surrounding land uses include large lot single family residential and light industrial. On May 9, 2007, the board approved the Entercom project, an entitlement package that included a general plan amendment, specific plan amendment, and rezone that proposed the current land use designations and zones, as well as a tentative subdivision map and design review. 
Here you can see the tentative subdivision map that was approved as part of the intercom project. It proposed 301 single family residential lots, one commercial lot, one open space lot, and three landscape corridor lots. Approval of the map expired before the map was recorded. However, the current general plan land use designations, East Antelope specific plan land use designations, and zoning approved with the intercom project were effectuated in perpetuity. At this time, the applicant is requesting a general plan amendment, specific plan amendment, and rezone to change the boundary configurations of the land use designations and zones with no change in the overall acreage of each designation and zone, a large lot tentative subdivision map, a small lot tentative subdivision map, and a design review. Here you can see the tentative, oh, Excuse me. Here you can see the proposed boundary changes for the zoning districts, which are identical to the boundary configurations proposed for the general plan land use designations and specific plan designations. As previously mentioned, there is no change to the overall acreage of each designation or zone. The most notable differences are the sort of squaring off of the RD20 portion and the more uniform width of the open space corridor. I'm actually going to skip over this slide so that you have a visual of the proposed project while I go through the analysis. As mentioned, the proposed project would create 171 new single family residential lots, a 5.1 acre multifamily lot, one 7.3 acre open space lot, and two, two landscape frontage lots and one remainder lot. Access to the subdivision would be from Antelope North Road to the east, sort of central east portion of the site there, and Poker Lane to the south. The project has been conditioned to realign Antelope North Road, which you can kind of see is that sharp turn off to the east of the project site. The realignment would be the more straightened out curve along the project boundary line. A new extension of Lewis Avenue would also be constructed, but would terminate in a court. That is on the western side of the property, and you can see the court at the northwestern corner. The proposed open space lot will contain the existing seasonal creek and be used for drainage, storage, and conveyance. The open space will be privately owned and maintained. The project complies with both minimum density requirements and maximum density caps as specified in the general plan, zoning code, and East Antelope specific plan. An addendum to the prior intercom project environmental impact report was prepared and found that the proposed project would not result in any new additional significant impacts that were not analyzed under the intercom EIR, would not substantially increase the severity of previously identified significant impacts, and that no site conditions have significantly changed since the intercom EIR was prepared. A project-specific mitigation monitoring and reporting program was prepared based on the analysis in the addendum. The Design Review Advisory Committee met on December 8th, 2023, and recommended that the board find the project in substantial compliance with the countywide design guidelines. The Antelope Community Planning Advisory Council met on February 2nd, 2023, and August 3rd, 2023, to consider the project, but did not make a formal recommendation of approval or denial to the board. Neighboring property owners voiced concerns regarding increased traffic and drainage issues. To address some of these issues, Lewis Avenue will dead end in a court to prevent traffic circulation into adjacent neighborhoods. The County Department of Water Resources has reviewed, the approved, has reviewed and approved a level two drainage analysis that demonstrates no offsite drainage impacts will result from the proposed development. The CPAC was generally supportive, oh, let me come back, sorry. The CPAC was generally supportive of increased housing and development in the area, but was also sympathetic to the community concerns. As such, the CPAC did not reach a consensus for a formal recommendation to the board. As you can see here, staff's recommendation for this project consists of two parts. A recommendation for an actual action the Planning Commission may take tonight, and a recommendation on the recommendations to the board. So at this time, staff is recommending the Planning Commission take the following action. Approve a resolution recommending the board approve the amendment to the general plan, changing the boundary configurations of land use designations on the subject parcel. Other part of this is that staff is also recommending the Planning Commission make the following recommendations to the board. Determine that the previously certified environmental or intercom final environmental impact report together with the CEQA addendum is adequate and complete. Adopt the mitigation monitoring and reporting program. 
approve a resolution and ordinance authorizing an amendment to the East Antelope Specific Plan and a rezone changing the boundary configuration of land use designations and zoning districts for the subject parcel, approve the large lot tentative subdivision map, approve the small lot tentative subdivision map, and find the project in substantial compliance with countywide design guidelines, all subject to findings and conditions. The applicant team is in attendance. We also have Mike Durkee, Senior Civil Engineer from the Department of Water Resources, and Matt Darrow, Division Chief of the Department of Transportation, Planning and Programs Division, and of course myself, to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Okay, what have I done? There we go. Oh. I'll kick us off this evening. I'm just a little confused on access to the community from the north side. Um, it looks like right now we just have one road that's dead ending to the north. Uh, is there an intention to connect that later on so there would be access? Excellent question. Let me go over a little bit of the history of that. So. The portion of Lewis Avenue that is along the western boundary of the project site would be new. It would be developed with the project. You can see some more dense subdivisions up there to the north. So directly north of the project, you've got some large lot agricultural residential, which is being used mostly as single family residential. And then all the way to the north, you've got that denser subdivision. The portion of Lewis Avenue in that denser subdivision all the way to the north is a public road that matches what will be constructed as part of the Antelope subdivision to the south. In the center, sort of between the project site and the denser subdivisions to the north, is a private section of Antelope, or excuse me, of Lewis Avenue that is not improved whatsoever. So it's no sidewalk, no curb, no gutter. The residents surrounding that private portion of Lewis Avenue were some of the most vocal community members at the CPAC, and they expressed one of their major concerns being that people would use Lewis Avenue and Olive Avenue to cut through their property and come down from the north into this new subdivision. To alleviate some of those concerns, the project has been conditioned to create that dead end court as well as a roadblock on the north end of the property. There is the goal of eventually connecting this public section of Lewis that will be created to the public section of Lewis all the way to the north that will run all the way to the county line. That would be accomplished through conditions of approval on future projects as these large lot residential areas in the middle, sort of between that subdivision in the north and this new subdivision in the south, get bought by you know, new developers or propose sub for future subdivision projects, anything like that. They would be conditioned to do road frontage improvements, dedicate portions of Lewis Avenue, and eventually it would connect to the north. But as of right now, there would be no access, no road access to the Antelope North subdivision from the north. So if we could go back to the road diagram for a second. I understand Lewis Avenue, and I think I understand the process there, but there's another road that terminates, just, oh, just terminates at the property boundary into somebody's backyard. Sure, yeah. Um, Where's that road going? <laughs> yeah, so as of right now, that would be a dead-end stub road. It does comply with DOT's um, requirement that stub roads not be more than the width of two parcels. It's only along, the stub portion of it is only along one parcel. Um, there is no intent to connect that at you know any point in the near future. Um, future development to the immediate north could certainly utilize that stub road to connect, but as of right now, it has been conditioned to be a dead end road. And so just so I understand, I'm just trying to get an idea of scale. Is that Lewis Avenue like the longest cul-de-sac in the county proposed? Uh, how, how far, that looks like a heck of a long distance for a a court. Yeah, we are talking about a 45 acre parcel, so fairly long. Um, I think it's about a, a little under a mile that's along that western edge. Um, I can't speak as to whether it's the longest. We do have DOT here to answer some of those more specific questions. The cul-de-sac design was proposed in order to allow for emergency vehicles and delivery vehicles to have a turnaround area. Additionally, there is a Knox box that will be at the end of the cul-de-sacs that if emergency vehicles do need to go through onto the private section of Lewis Avenue to the north, they would be able to do that. So access through for emergency vehicles cul-de-sac is for turnaround of delivery vehicles. I can't answer if it's the longest one, but we do have DOT. 
So it would be a secondary access. So say if emergency services need to come from the other side, they can come from the north. This is our second point of access for emergency vehicles too? Well, there's actually two points of access that are always open provided along poker with that intersection of, I don't unfortunately have the map directly in front of me, so I don't know what that label is there. On the middle portion of the south boundary, you can see a road that goes up, so that's one. And then on the eastern portion, there's one that comes in off of Antelope North Road. So without Lewis Avenue altogether, there's already two public access points, but Lewis Avenue would be an access point for emergency vehicles from the south or into the north through that Knox box. Yeah, I get that for the most of the community, but Lewis Avenue folks, there's only one way in and out of their house, right? Unless they drive around the barrier. Like I'm, I'm, just, I'm just a re the resident that lives on Lewis Avenue. I've got to drive past 30 other houses if I live at the end of that cul-de-sac. Uh, that's correct. And I... It's like 10 or 12 houses, but that is correct, yeah. That would be the one way out. Okay. Okay, well, that concludes my questions for now. Uh, other questions for staff? Well, along the, the length of that cul-de-sac, were there security or lighting issues addressed or concerns raised related to the... I mean, if... The, yeah, the so back of that street is going to get very little kind of eyes on it, if you will. Sure, yeah, and I, I think for the community to the north, their main concern was not wanting traffic to come up through or down through, depending on whether you're coming from the north or south. And so their main focus was on having that roadblock preventing that, but it would have to comply with DOT's standard conditions for lighting and roads, and I have Matt Darrow here who I think can expand upon that. Yeah. Hi, yeah, my name is Matt Darrow. I'm the uh, Chief of Planning and Programs for Transportation. Um, I was kind of just listening to the conversations go back and forth, and um, a lot of things that I would just interject is, is um, on some of the conversation that was happening is that, yeah, I mean, what we're talking about is uh, generally in, um, a rural area that's getting set up for planning for, for roads and streets and, and anticipation of potentially future development that happens in the in the in the years to come maybe maybe not right but you got to set it up accordingly and you have existing neighborhoods to the north here that we don't want to connect to these private roads just yet so you set this this road up i think the question was a long long cul-de-sac not ideal we don't want to do it that way but we also heard we don't want to connect to the north yet so if you don't want to connect to the north you have to put a break there if you put a brake there and you have vehicles that need to travel to the end and then turn around and come back, you have to put what looks like a cul-de-sac there. It's a turnaround. But the idea would be, and, and, and you heard planning talk about that, at some point in the future, if the north does develop, we would want to make that connection. Same thing with the stubbed road a little bit to the right, to the, to the east there. It's headed to the back, probably to the back property of somebody. It's not going to connect right now. If that north property ever does redevelop, we would condition those developers to connect to this road. And so we would want to, we, we don't want to treat this piece of property in the future as its own little one, one way in, one way out. We want to have that set up for, for future connections and connectivity to spread traffic out throughout, right? And it hasn't come up yet, but um, I think maybe I'll bring it up now. It, that's kind of an example of what had happened with the East Antelope specific plan years ago with the break in poker, right? We, we probably, I, I assume people are familiar with the fact that there's a traffic break on poker lane right now to the west of this property, which is actually one of the conditions that's placed on this development is time to reevaluate whether or not it's time to take that traffic break out. Um, and the idea at that point in time was that when this property, the one that's up on the screen plus the rest of the property uh, on the um, rural in the rural nature, wanted to kind of be separated from all the development that happened along Don Julio and you know to the west of here, right? So that's another consideration um, that is going to be analyzed as part of one of the conditions that this development has on it. So those are. I think hopefully I addressed the questions that I heard be bandied around. 
you you addressed them, but then you also brought up another one. There is a break right now on poker. There's a barricade on poker yep. lane. Yep. Where is that barricade located? Uh, I'm not sure that that's in your package, Emma. I don't. I don't. I don't know if. Yeah, it's that. further to the west along Poker Lane. Just uh, so yeah, barely so, outside of where what's shown right now. So right now, Poker Lane is that road that kind of is on the very bottom of this drawing that goes diagonal from from left to right and intersects intersects at Antelope North on the bottom. Is that making sense? And if you take that road, so the left is west. If you take that road west, um, it, you hit the edge, the left edge of this drawing, right? But then that road curves a little bit to the left and then heads towards Don Julio. About midway between... <laughs> yeah, is this a clicker? <laughs> I don't know if you have... And yeah, it's almost better to just basically the left side of that drawing. Um, do we know where poker? Do you guys know where poker lane is? Yep. Okay, so poker lane from the bottom of the red on the right side of the drawing, follow it to the west, and somewhere in the vicinity of where the green drawing stops is a traffic break. So you cannot travel east and west through poker lane to get to Don Julio. At some, that, that was a conscious decision made for the East Antelope specific plan. The idea was this area that's on the screen was rural in nature, and the area to the west of that break that was put in at the time was now developing, and they wanted to be separate, right? So as, as uh, and if and when development occurs in this area, it's supposed to be reconsidered. Do we open that break, right? Can people, instead of having to go out onto Antelope North, down and around and back up Don Julio, can we go east and west on poker? Is it time to take the break out? And a condition is placed on this development to analyze that. And they would analyze that, hire uh, a consultant to analyze that. My development um, team in transportation would review the findings and decide yeah, it's time or no, it's not yet time based on impacts to other offsite signals and roadways. So might as well throw that poker lane conversation out right now too, right? Commissioners, uh, Todd Smith, planning director here, just wanna jump in to give you an, a sense of how far away that traffic break is. It is roughly 1500 feet to the west of uh, the project boundary along Poker Lane. So over a quarter mile away. Matt, um, could you talk about the improvements on the street uh, for Lewis Avenue that might help with some safety concerns I heard? For example, lighting, would street lights be um, required on Lewis Avenue? Yeah, that, that's a good question. So in terms of the development that's in red and maybe the clicker, if I go one of the directions, will I get to that drawing again? A few slides forward. That's intercom. Keep going. Keep going? Yeah. One more or two more. There you go. Okay. So everything that you see on this, on this map, and, and a lot of times that gets lost in the shuffle, everything that you see in this drawing will be new, improved, fully improved roads, right? Curb, gutter, sidewalk, all that good stuff. Where they, in fact, where they front and low north, that, that'll be a widened uh, four-lane roadway section with a center turn lane in the middle, we'll have curb, gutter, sidewalk. Everything that, that fronts on any of the existing roads will have improvements as well. So. Um, and I think one of the analysis has to do with uh, potential for installing traffic signal at Antelope Road North and Poker, which is the bottom intersection uh, at Poker. Um, I believe the intersection at uh, whatever the east-west middle roadway is that access Antelope North Road is uh, a side street stop. Um, but all the improvements will occur on that site. which includes visibility easements, the ability to kind of come to the side of the road, to look left, look right, and be able to see oncoming traffic, to make the decision to, to go or not. So 
So just out of curiosity, why are we waiting to do the analysis on the poker road barrier? Because it seems like if we're going to approve uh, a significant number of houses but then have no way to get into those houses, it's going to piss off a lot of people. So the ways to get into the houses are all, you're still going to access this developed from Antelope Road North, uh, poker, the center east-west road, uh, the roads that are off of poker, you'll have the ability to do right, that right now. The analysis will be part, it will occur prior to um, prior to any improvements being reviewed, correct? Yeah, yeah, so the condition is drafted in a way that it says the, the applicant has to provide a traffic study addressing the conditions of removing that poker lane roadblock, as well as putting a signal in at the intersection of poker lane and Antelope North, um, prior to approval of improvement plans. So none of these houses can be constructed, none of these houses can be, you know, start groundbreaking until that traffic study has been provided and DOT has made a determination of whether that removal of the traffic break as well as signalization of Poker Lane and Antelope North is needed. Um, the, the decision to not require it with the entitlement but to defer it to prior to improvement plan approval was reached in collaboration with the applicant. Um, they really did not want to proceed with a lengthy, expensive traffic study at this time. So that was the compromise worked out between the county and the applicant. Okay. Thank you. Uh, other questions for staff this evening? All right, thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, at this time, we'll invite the applicant up. Greg Bardini and Ken Topper with Morton and Patello. And um, if you do not swear, do you so affirm that the testimony that you're about to give the commission is the truth, so help you God? I do so affirm. Thank you. And if you can make this statement, I have been sworn. I have been sworn. Thank you. Please proceed. Greg Bardini with Morton and Patello. Thank you. Um, appreciate everything. I know it's a long list of entitlements, but really it's the general plan amendment, specific plan amendment rezone squaring off some parcels, the areas aren't changing. Um, in relationship to some of the questions that were asked is, you're correct on the stub street to the right, which facilitates future development because the drainage ravine runs through there. Uh, we, along with staff, determined that access may be problematic to the north uh, because of the drainage. And so that's why that sub street was provided. As it relates to the long cul-de-sac, it's 17 lots that are on that cul-de-sac. So it's not a tremendous number. The previous approval had a similar situation with 27 units. Uh, so in our opinion, this was a much better configuration. Um, I think Mr. Darrow did a good job answering other questions as it relates to Poker Lane. The connectivity study basically with improvement plans, because it really doesn't change the improvements. We're setting up the intersection for a signal, but the question comes, does that break uh, be taken out now or later, and it's just a matter of removing the barricade. Um, those are the questions that I heard, but I am here for any questions, as is my staff. So I drive west on Poker Lane. Do I hit the barricade first, or do I have another intersection? Uh, there's a, the homes that are fronting, so as you come up Poker Lane, you're going to make that, that left, as you indicated. Um, and basically, as was indicated, about 1,300 feet till the barricade's there. The barricade's right at the, what is the Antelope Woods subdivision, so that's where the small lots begin. Um, I don't know if there's, an, I think there's one more street that heads north. Yeah, it's Cook Riolo Road. It goes north and south. And I got my cheat sheet. Yes, Cook Riello Road. So those houses that are on Poker Lane, how do they get there right now? If there's a barricade at Poker and they Cook come Riello. off of uh, Antelope North Road, take Poker Lane to their homes, got or it. they can take Cook Riello Road up. And again, that's rural residential lots that are over there. 
but per the East Antelope Plan, the reason the improvements are phased as such is the East Antelope Plan, you know, allows for higher densities of residential in this area, and that's why the improvements are being constructed or being contemplated for the future development and build-out capacities. Uh, but as Mr. Darrow indicated, just not all the roads know to, need to be opened yet. For the same reason, the cul-de-sac and EVA at Lewis, if they were to ever to develop to the north, then that access would go through to facilitate circulation to the north. I, I understand that. Is there any reason we didn't use a, a more standard methodology of saying, hey, when X number of units are there, then we make these changes? That's typically how we phase or at least what I've seen, transportation improvements. It's not, well, we'll come back and study it again later. Well, it would be environmental, oh, Mr. Durr. I just feel much more comfortable. It says, hey, at the construction of house number 105, barricade is removed because at that point, we know that the traffic overwhelms the existing improvements, so we have to have another exit. Yeah, uh, so the language in the East Antelope specific plan, I think uses, it, uses, uh, it says, when a majority of, of development occurs to the east of the break, it's time, right? That's not a good, not a really great indication. So the only way we can really define it is have it be studied. So we're going to have it be studied. That'll, that'll include scoping the study that, that, um, that the applicant here will commission. We scope it. We work with their, um, whoever they hire as a consultant, uh, and then we look and see what impacts exist. If, if, if this does not cause a problem, we don't open it. If it does cause problems in the network, then we talk about opening it, right? So, uh, but yeah, there's no, there's no study that's been done that allow us to say at 100 units, right? Then you do it. So that study really needs to happen. And it's possible that that study comes out and makes those kinds of recommendations. When we get this many units of development on the east of the break, then it's time to open this. And that could be either before or, or this gets all the way built out, or that could be after this gets all the way built out. We really need that study to tell us. Okay, thank you. I will add that there's an environmental document, uh, that we, you know, the addendum that was prepared. And so that did do traffic studies, because what we're talking, one is a break in access, the other one is level of service and, and you know, stop delays. And per that document, there weren't any significant traffic impacts uh, that constituted, you know, change in roadway sizes, configuration, or volumes. And that assumed those barriers stayed in place in that study? In that or that assumed that they were taken out because they're temporary? <laughs> I'm not a traffic expert, but I believe the way the traffic study looked at it is they looked at the uh, project plus existing conditions or variations thereof and then cumulative conditions. So the existing conditions would have had that break in access under the cumulative conditions built out of the area would assume they were gone to. But again, I'm speculating on that as well, Chair. Yeah, that would make sense. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, other questions for the applicant team? Commissioner Corona Sabanillo. Yeah. I just have one question. I don't know. Maybe this is for staff. I was just curious. It looks like there are no trails planned for this project, but are there trails to connect to, or are there no trails because there are no, nothing to connect to? A little old answer for staff. A little of both. Uh, okay. There's really no connectivity in the area. We do. Uh, we had looked at trails at one time, but the Parks District nor the county wanted to take ownership of the open space, and so therefore public access was not provided. We did lay out the subdivision as such that the roadways are single loaded in a majority of the areas so that we have sidewalks on the roadways, um, but there will not be trails traversing the open space. Yeah, to expand upon that a little bit, we did work with, um, I believe it's Sunrise Parks and Rec in this area, and they felt so there's there's two other parks already within, I think it's a quarter mile or a half mile of the center of this development. And so they did not feel, that, and the, both of those parks are already underutilized for the population in the area, and so they felt that they already had sufficient recreational facility capacity and did not um, have any desire to receive a dedication of this open space and use it as managed park or recreation facility within the rec our, the special district. Um, and so the open space will be privately owned and maintained. It is intended to be used as passive recreation. It will be, you know, landscaped. It'll have drainage ponds that 
all those things that provide passive recreation uses. No trails are actually proposed with this entitlement. Um, there's really no connectivity. There's no trails to the north or south to connect to, um, but it is a, intended to be a, a passive recreational facility. Any other questions for the applicant team? Um, what is the mechanism for the maintenance of that? Yeah, so I believe it's project condition, it's like 9, 10, 11, 12, um, address, and then there's one in, in the DWR conditions as well that basically require a the, the applicant provide evidence of a private maintenance and ownership entity that may be an HOA, it may be um, just, you know, a, a, an individual um, prior to, um, I believe it's, it's approval of improvement plans. I don't have the conditions in front of me right now, I apologize. Um, so it would be to the satisfaction of County Planning Environmental Review and Department of Water Resources because this open space is used for a lot of drainage conveyance and does have several drainage basins within it, um, that the applicant provide evidence of an ongoing ownership and maintenance entity and plan prior to getting approval of their improvement plans. Thank you. Thank you so much. Great. In close, I'd like to thank you for your consideration and ask that you follow staff's recommendation for uh, recommending approval. I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. And with that, we'll move on to public comment. And there are no public comments for this item either. Thank you. We'll go ahead and close public comment. And I know I had that um, condition here just a second ago in front of me. I'm just trying to figure out. Let me just have, unless somebody wants to kick us off, I was just going to look at the Department of Transportation conditions real quick. Or if somebody has the number for the uh, poker lane condition. I believe it's 68 or 69. We're, we're checking right now. There it is, 69, yep. Yeah. 67 is the uh, connectivity study. So prior to approval of the improvement plans, improvement plans would mean grading and construction of any infrastructure. That is correct. Okay. I, I think, you know, looking at this, my view on it is, is these changes were relatively minor. Um, I don't love the, hey, we're just going to throw up barricades that are temporary, but we don't really have a strong plan of when we remove them. Um, but as long as, you know, it's studied uh, and it's noted in here that these are temporary and that we intend to connect the community eventually to the community around it, um, I can get on board. Chair Rathel, if you did um, care to look at the maintenance and um, ownership condition, I believe it is 120 under the Department of Water Resources section. Thank you. Any other thoughts this evening on the project? I think it's less than ideal when you have private drives in between two developed parcels of land. Um, not sure you how you solve that here, however. Um, I think staff has done a pretty good job of addressing as best as they could. Yeah, in the fair share agreement, they're contributing to the intersection that's now, now blocked off. I think that's pretty clear that these residents should eventually have access to the intersection they're helping pay for. Um, and a number of prop, a number of um, things that are called out as their fair share are currently barricaded off from them. So I wouldn't expect the residents to pay their fair share from things that they'd have to drive all the way around because they're barricaded from accessing near their house. Mm -hmm. 
So I'm happy to move staff recommendation um, on this just with the you know, highlight of, uh, I know this is going to the Board of Supervisors, um, so it's just a concern of ours that um, we definitely want to see the community connected uh, long term, uh, both to the west and the north. I can second that. Any other deliberation or discussion? I just wanted to disclose I did uh, communicate with the applicant via email and some questions. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other disclosures? All right, please call the roll. And Commissioners Rathel. Yes. Corona Sabanano. Yes. Tatishi. Yes. And Devlin. Yes. And the motion carries with those members present. Thank you. Uh, that concludes our planning commission agenda for this evening. Uh, we're now going to move on to our board of zoning appeals uh, agenda item. Uh, will you please call item number four? And item number four this evening is an appeal of a conditional use permit, special development permit and design review, um, located at 4626 Auburn Boulevard, approximately 342 feet from the intersection of Auburn Boulevard and Myrtle Avenue in the Carmichael Old Fiddle Farms community. And the environmental document is a negative declaration. Thank you. Good evening, Chair Rathel, members of the Board of Zoning Appeals. My name is Christian Balthazar. I'm an assistant planner with Planning and Environment Review and lead planner for this project. I would like to inform you all that there has been a change to the request originally approved by the Zoning Administrator uh, to address concerns about visual intrusion by neighboring property owners. The applicant reduced the proposed tower height from 85 feet to 80 feet. This was the reason why the applicant requested a continuance from the previous hearing. All materials presented and provided to you have been revised to account for this change. The project is located at 4626 Auburn Boulevard in the Carmichael Old Foothill Hill Farms community. The subject site is currently developed with a 2,400 square foot warehouse constructed in 1982, which is proposed to remain. The site is in the general commercial or GC zoning district. The surrounding area contains a mixture of commercial retail businesses and residential uses zone GC or residential density 10. While the site is adjacent to RD10 zoning to the southeast, there is a recreational common area immediately adjacent to the parcels and not residences. Upon staff's review, there are no previous planning entitlements or active code violations on site. Mm -hmm. The request is a CPAC appeal of the zoning administrator's approval of the following. A conditional use permit to allow a new wireless communication facility in the general commercial zoning district a special development permit to allow the proposed project to deviate from the following development standards, that is maximum height standards, separation from interior property boundary standard, and separation from group one zone property standards. And additionally, also a design review to comply with Sacramento County wide design guidelines is being requested. On screen now is the site plan for the project. The lease area is a triangular portion of the parcel located to the south, located on the southern side of the property. It is about 3,895 square feet in size. Along with the wireless communication facility, two concrete pads are being proposed to accommodate equipment cabinets and a 25 kilowatt diesel backup generator. The wireless communication facility and concrete pads are proposed to be secured by a six foot tall chain link fence with slats. The site would be accessed from an existing driveway coming off of Auburn Boulevard. I would also like to note that the applicant has worked with planning to relocate the tower to its current proposed location. Initially, the tower was proposed in the southern, uh, in the southeast corner, uh, which is only proposed to be 16 feet from the eastern property line and seven feet from the southern property line. Uh, due to the limited size of the lease area, separation from interior property boundaries and separation from group one standards could not be met. Shown on screen now are the north and west elevations for the proposed 80-foot wireless communication facility. And these are the east and south elevations. As you can see, the applicant is proposing a monopine stealth design. As proposed, the wireless communication facility would be able to accommodate up to two additional wireless co-location tenants. On May 25th, 2023, the Design Review Advisory Committee, or DRAC, reviewed the proposed project and recommended the Zoning Administrator find the project in substantial compliance with design guidelines. The Carmichael Old Foothill Farms uh, CPAC met on June 14, 2023, and recommended the Zoning Administrator deny the requested entitlements with votes of four yes, zero no, and one absent. 
five members of the public spoke in opposition to this proposed project. The comments included concerns raised over health and safety in terms of radiation exposure, sensitive groups residing in the surrounding area, and over -concentra concentration of cell towers in the area. The project was heard by the zoning administrator on August 3rd, 2023. Following staff's presentation, seven members of the public spoke, spoke in opposition to this item. The ZA continued the item for staff to research if the proposed project could be conditioned to limit the height of the tower. On August 17, 2023, the project once again, once again was heard by the zoning administrator. Staff reported back the height of the tower could not be conditioned. Following staff's presentation, six members of the public provided comments, and the ZA noted that the project proposed adequate stealth design and that there is a need to expand cell accessibility. Following this, the ZA approved the project. The Carmichael Old Foothill Farm CPAC held a meeting on August 23rd, 2023, to consider submitting a community-wide interest appeal of the project approval. Following deliberations, the CPAC approved with the votes of four yes and zero no to appeal the zoning administrator's approval to the Board of Zoning Appeals. The Carmichael Old Foothill Farm CPAC provided two justifications to the community-wide interest appeal, which were aesthetics and precedent and setback requirements. This appeal, the appeal form is included in your hearing packets as attachment nine. Under the justification for aesthetics, it was stated that an 85 foot tower, um, if the 80 foot tower is proposed tower and stealth design do not blend into the surrounding area, it could have a negative effect on property values. Additionally, the appeal stated that the applicant did not, did not adequately demonstrate the need for an 85 foot tower. Under justification for precedent and setback requirements, it was stated that if setbacks are allowed to be modified, this could set a dangerous precedent for other carriers to do the same. The reasoning was that in the case of tower collapse, the reduced setbacks could increase the danger of neighboring, neighboring properties. And lastly, the appeal asked if the tower met the criteria for earthquake and wind safety, and if the applicant had considered alternative site locations. On screen now are photo simulations of the proposed site facing east across Auburn Boulevard. The image to the left shows existing conditions on the top and the, previous, and the previously proposed tower of at 85 feet to the bottom. The image to the right shows existing conditions at the top and the proposed tower at, 85, at 80 feet in height at the bottom. These are the photo simulations facing northeast across Auburn Boulevard, once again showing existing conditions at the top, previously proposed 85 foot tower at the bottom left, and currently proposed 80 foot tower on the bottom right. Additional photo simulations showing proposed, uh, the proposed tower from different locations or directions are also included as attachment 11 in your packet. The proposed monop monopine stealth design was selected to reduce attention to additional height and reduce setbacks. View of the lower portion of the monopine and equipment area will be obstructed by the existing building on site and fencing around the property from all locations except for the rear of the property. Given the urban, urban environment, the proposed project will not substantially degrade the existing visual character of the surrounding area and is largely compatible with existing architecture, surrounding trees, and overhead power lines. The applicant provided coverage map with and without the 80-foot tall wireless communication facility to demonstrate the need for a new tower in the area. The areas shown in yellow are low coverage areas. The areas shown in green represent ideal coverage, and the blue dot represents the location of the proposed wireless communication facility. To the left of the screen, excuse me, sorry. To the left of the screen is a coverage map of the existing coverage conditions without the proposed wireless communication facility. As shown, the proposed project site and portions of Auburn Boulevard are in the low coverage area. To the right of the screen is the coverage map with the proposed wireless communication facility, showing that with the new tower, coverage gaps would be filled around the project site and on Auburn Boulevard. The applicant has stated that an area of focus was increasing the coverage on Auburn Boulevard, not only for drivers, but also for emergency service providers traveling along this road. On screen now are coverage maps showing the difference in coverage from a 65 foot wireless communication facility to the right. And uh, just to note, a 65, 65 feet is the max height allowed in this um, zoning district without the need for a special development permit. And to the left is a coverage map showing the difference in coverage with the requested 80 foot wireless communication facility. The applicant was asked to provide this exhibit to demonstrate the need um, for the requested height deviations. 
Additionally, the applicant provided a certified structural letter included as attachment 13. This letter states that the wireless communication facility would be designated to withstand basic wind speeds of up to 94 miles an hour and would uh, also meet seismic requirements in accordance with the California Building Code. Uh, lastly, included as attachment 14, the applicant also provided an alternative site summary. The summary states that there was a consideration for co-locations of eight other existing towers near the identified area. All the considered co-location properties were not chosen due to the site being too far away from the area identified lacking coverage or because T-Mobile was already co-located on that site. This was a, a contributing factor to the applicant's decision that a new tower was needed. Planning and Environmental Review staff found that the proposed monopine stealth design meets the special development permit specific findings in zoning code section 6.4.6.H.5. The proposed project with deviations requested meets all the special development permit general findings and that it would not conflict with any applicable general plan or community plan policies. The deviations requested are justified by project design and would not result in any unintended impacts or detract from a higher quality development on the project site. As previously mentioned, the proposed project was supported by the DRAC. Although the CPAC recommended denial due to concerns over health and safety, it was determined that radio frequency and microwave emission exposures will be well below the general public limits allowed by the FCC. An environmental document for this project was prepared as an initial study and negative declaration and was released uh, for public review on June 16, 2023. The document concluded that there are no significant environmental concerns. Planning and Environmental Review staff recommends the Board of Zoning Appeals to deny the CPAC appeal, maintaining the Zoning Administrator's approval of the proposed project, determine the environmental analysis prepared pursuant to California Environmental Quality Act is adequate and complete, approve the conditional use permit, special development permit, subject to findings and conditions, and find the project in substantial compliance with countywide design guidelines. Uh, with this, I conclude my presentation. I would like to note that both uh, the applicant, Brian Cook, is present, and also the appellant, CPAC Chair uh, Nick, Nick Blois, is also present in, in person as well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, questions for Mr. Balthazar this evening? Did I hear correctly you state that one of the reasons the applicant is interested in this site was that they were unable to find uh, an, a, another tower to co-locate at? Uh, that's correct. Um, attachment, I believe I mentioned, one second. Uh, attachment 14 was an uh, alternative site summary in which the uh, applicant uh, looked at eight other existing towers on site to co-locate first rather than proposing a new tower. Additionally to that, um, to that statement, there was also four locations for proposal of new towers, or uh, I apologize, three locations for proposed locations of new towers that they, they try to reach out, but weren't able to come to agreement with property owners to establish the site there. Other questions for staff this evening? Thank you. Thank you. All right, so in this case, the appellant is the CPAC chair, so they would speak next. No, we'll just do this the way we do any pro, it's de novo hearing, so we'll just go with the applicant. Okay, yeah. applicant and then um, CPAC. But I would give the appellant more than two or three minutes to make their case when they're up for but public we'll, comment. We'll have the appellant make the comments during public comment? Yes. Okay. You guys are looking like you're... Uh, we don't do Board of Zoning Appeals very often, so I understand we all... I'm, I was looking through my notes here of what we had, so... The, the appeal is, is why we're here. I know. So... Yeah, we still do a de novo hearing. Okay. So that means this board, this board of zoning appeals, is just rehearing the, the project application, not necessarily limited to the grounds raised by the appellant, uh, even though those frame the issues to be con to be considered. But yes, we would just do it like according to the ordinary procedure. It doesn't make much of a difference, honestly. Fair enough. 
Fair enough. So it's up to the chair on timing, though, for the appellants? No, my advice is to give more than two or three minutes for the appellant. Right. Okay. Absolutely. The appellant okay. will give uh, as much time as they need uh, to make their case. Um, at this time, we'll invite the applicant down, uh, and we'll start there. If the applicant wants to address the commission. Good evening. Okay. Sir, if I could get you sworn in, please, if you could please raise your right hand. And do you swear the testimony that you're about to give the commission is the truth, so help you God. And if you do not swear, do you so affirm? I affirm. Okay, if you could please state your name for the record and make the statement that I have been sworn. Brian Cook, I have been sworn. Thank you. Please proceed. Thank you. I'm Brian Cook, applicant representative, Tillman Infrastructure. Uh, I also have um, uh, Derek Kelly. Uh, from T-Mobile RF Engineering here to answer any questions. Thank you, Christian and staff, for presenting our project. It was spot on as far as history is concerned. And unless there's anything else, let me know if you have a question and I'll be happy to answer it. I have a question. Uh, so looking at the difference, and I saw the, the, the map that showed the 65 foot versus the 80 foot differential from the, I guess, applicant or the T-Mobile's perspective, that 80 foot was necessary to reach the full coverage zone and 65 would not complete, <clears throat> I guess, the area in the prior map before that? That is correct. And uh, Sacramento County requires a, a co-locatable um, structure. So the reduction in height would actually eliminate a carrier to be able to co-locate on our uh, tower. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. And I guess I had questions on that too. To me, the green area on that coverage map was the coverage that could be achieved with a 65 foot tower, is that correct? Derek, I'm gonna let him address. Oh. So I kind of have to combine the two in my own head, right? Which isn't mm -hmm. ideal, because I'm not a wireless expert by any stretch of the imagination, but I think I can overlay the two maps. And if I look at the previous map and this map, that green area all gets filled in. So I'm quite confused on the justification for the extra 15 feet. Yeah, we'll get you, we'll get you sworn really in too, that. come on up. It, it's a technical, uh, question and and that's why I have my experts here. Okay, if you could press the podium. And if you'll raise your right hand, please. And do you swear that the testimony you're about to give the commission is the truth to help you, God? And if you do not swear, do you so affirm? I do so affirm. Okay, and if you could state your name for the record. My name is Derek Kelly. And make this statement, I have been sworn. I have been sworn. Thank you so much. So I believe the question is why the difference between uh, 65 feet and 80 feet, or what is the difference there? I think the maps show that uh, the green footprint at 80 feet is significantly bigger than the green footprint at 65 feet. Um, the question as to why we prefer 80 feet over 65 feet, uh, 80 feet I would say would, would be the minimum uh, rad center for our antennas to provide optimal network performance in the area. Okay. The, and as Brian stated, you know, 65 feet means that the next co-located carrier is gonna be significantly lower. So that'll be at perhaps 55 feet. But if you go to this previous slide, this 65 foot tower would meet that hole in coverage that's shown on the previous slide. Yeah, the 65 feet would fill that hole, but what is not shown in this presentation is the fact that we have sites to the north and sites to the south, which are both, both suffering congestion. So the main driver for us installing this site is to relieve congestion on the surrounding sites, not to provide coverage. And the second point I would like to make, I'm not, I'm not sure uh, exactly what coverage levels were shown here, but when you look at uh, T-Mobile's website, the PCC, they do a personal coverage check map, that only shows outdoor coverage. So that um, 
is not necessarily showing what um, a, a user who is using their phone inside their house, for example, or inside a building is going to be experiencing. Um, and T-Mobile has also been selling a lot of home internet devices now, so people are accessing the cellular network for home internet. And these maps, I don't believe, are going to show the reality of that situation. And they are computer models, and um, so you know, please understand that when taking that into consideration. Other questions for the applicant this evening? So I, I do have a well. Maybe this is a question for the county staff. So I'll, I'll hold on that. Uh, as far as this site goes, um, I know originally you guys looked at the southeast corner, which was abutting the residential much more than this site. Um, did you guys look at the northern corner of this site, which is further away from residential? Or did you consider the center of the site? I'm just trying to figure out. I understand this site has challenges, but um, you know, being closer to residential obviously has its concerns also. So, I actually, if I remember correctly, the setbacks actually killed that um, upper location, and the fact that the property owner wanted to add on to that building at some point. So, we were kind of forced a bit where we are, and it's an odd, it's an odd uh, APN what we call because it's triangular. So, it was just very unusual but yeah we did look okay other questions for the applicant this evening well, and again just the over the the driving need is obviously a gap in coverage but you were unable to find another tower to co-locate with <clears throat> and that's because they were full or there were no towers within the vicinity that um met the coverage objective there is one that I actually drove to look at. It's at the end of uh, Auburn next to the uh, sheriff's office there. And it had come up in discussion, I believe, at the CPAC. I don't really remember. But that tower is closest, but it is completely overwhelmed and overloaded. I... It would have to come down. There, there would be no way for us to co-locate on it, besides it just being outside the ring completely. So, Other questions for the applicant team? All right, thank you. All right, at this time, uh, we'll move on to public comment, and we will start with the, uh, the CPAC chair. Thank you so much for coming out this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Nick Blois, Mr. Chair, uh, Commissioners. Uh, my name is Nick Blois, Chair of the Carmichael O. Foot Harl Farm CPAC. And I just wanted to state for the record, I was a uh, United States Army Signal Corps officer who went to nodal management training. I erected these towers prior to Verizon and T-Mobile being out here. So I can give some other alternatives other than uh, what they have provided technically. So um, as you know, the federal government has put a heavy footprint on the county on what we can and cannot uh, allow. So we're going to go through a very narrow channel on how this can be disallowed or denied. Uh, the number one reason being aesthetics. At the time of our receipt of this uh, application, the applicant had failed to provide documentation uh, and tower simulation views for the 65 and 85 foot towers at all angles. Um, I'm not sure if that has changed, but that was our understanding. That would be one reason to deny. Uh, in addition, the applicant needs to demonstrate a need for the tower to exceed 65 feet. That may have happened. I'm not aware, but that was also not happening at the time of our review. Um, the tower uh, height as an eyesore can impact property values negatively. And once again, that aesthetic aspect uh, is, is affecting the property values. So that is, that is condition number one. Uh, number two, failure to follow required setbacks sets a dangerous precedent. There's a reason for these setbacks. And I believe that uh, one uh, way we could look at that is um, something called fall zone. 
So there are structural failures of towers. Um, these tower collapses um, have happened throughout the nation. There are numerous lawsuits, both, um, both uh, for the folks who worked for uh, these commercial providers as well as the people below who were injured. Um, the fact that there is a pool right near this where children could be playing and an unforeseen collapse could occur, um, this is something that, that the Planning Commission needs to consider. It is part of the setbacks in the sense of the setbacks that we already have setback requirements which must be deviated from in order to approve this plan. Um, nationally, I've done research and found that 150 foot setbacks have been implemented in some locales. Also a radius of 1.5 to two times the height of the tower as the radius, as a setback. So that would be between 127, sorry, I was at 85 feet prior to this meeting. So uh, my numbers are 127.5 feet to 170 foot setbacks in some locales throughout the nations. So those are requirements for a structural collapse of a tower. Um, and so these, these are grounds for denying the application. Now I will say that in addition to co-location, you can find another site. And if we go to slide one, um, is it right here? And back arrow? How far back? It's got, I gotta go all the way to one, sorry. Oop. How do we go forward? Okay, Oop. let me see one back. So if we look at the red zone there, which is a triangle, you could see that to the south, there are several different properties that move away from residential property that, that could be potential sites. The reason, the, if you think of the tower as a circle, as, a, as the dot with a circle around it, you could achieve similar coverage um, just by moving the tower. So I just wanted to bring that up as a possibility that co-location is not necessary, but another site is could be an option, and there is some undeveloped property uh, further uh, to the south, um, well, due south of the, of the proposed site. So those, those are our thoughts on this matter. I know it's a very uh, narrow uh, decision and a nar very narrow window, but we do ask that this be denied um, for the protection of the community. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Boyce. Okay. And I'm going to I'm going to propose that we allow rebuttal from both parties, just so everyone's due process rights are observed. Agreed. If they if they want. Agreed. We will step through the rest of the public comment, and then we will allow rebuttals. Yes. First up, uh, we have Pete Sorrell uh, on deck. Uh, we've got Stephen Purcell. So, uh, Mr. Sorrell, if you're ready, come on down. I'd like to allot my time to Ms. Kathleen Reed. Okay, do we have uh, somebody who's speaking on behalf of the group? Uh, Ms. Kathleen Reed? We have several people, several people. In my time also, I'm Steve Purcell, and I'd like my time to Kathleen Reed as well. Okay, uh, Ms. Reed, why don't you come on down? We'll give you five minutes uh, as a representative of a group. We'll, we'll give you five minutes, and if you still need more, we'll talk about it then. Right. The general rule we follow on representatives for a group is five minutes total. We don't add up I the do number of speakers. I the only person we were able to do this last time. Oh. My speech is six and a half minutes long. I just ask for a little bit Well, the bit chair more. has discretion to allow you to speak for okay, six and a half minutes. Okay, thank you very much. I'm sure he'll be okay with that. And then thank again, you. how much time that. are we allotting, uh, Ms. Kathleen Reed. Ms. Reed, we'll give you six and a half minutes. That'll be just fine. We Thank understand you. you have a large group you're speaking on behalf of, and we want to hear you Thank out. Thank you. Okay. Proceed when you're ready. I have to be sworn in. Do we need to swear? Do I have I, to be sworn in? Yes, we do. Yeah, let's go ahead and okay, get you let's, sworn in. Okay, let's swear in all of the public folks that are going to give public time. comments this evening. If you'll just stand up and raise your right hand. Thank you. You all. We'll get you all sworn in, and when you come down, you just state your name, and I have been sworn. Right. 
Okay, do you all swear that the testimony that you're about to give the commission is the truth to help you God? And if you do not swear, do you so affirm? And as the uh, chair has stated, when you do come to the podium, if you could state your name for the record and make this statement, I have been sworn. I have been sworn, Kathleen thank, Reed. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. This evening you have a great responsibility. You hold the lives of the people in my neighborhood in your hands. We come before you in a last attempt to appeal to your humanity and common decency and with regard to the future of our community. It's been a six and a half month journey since the first CPAC meeting was held in which 28 neighbors protested the tower. We explained that we are a neighborhood of duplexes with 151 households with 78% home ownership a very responsible homeowners association that works to keep up this niche, and the lovely park, which was spoken of, has a pool, a basketball court, tennis courts, and a children's play area that we own and almost everyone uses. Our park is right next to the proposed cell tower and serves many new families with small children that have recently moved here, and the many retired people who, like myself, have been in here for years and those in between. There are pockets of low-income neighborhoods next to us, but ours is not one of them. Since then, 291 signatures have been gathered, numerous calls made and emails sent, and five additional meetings held. The Tillman Company, working with T-Mobile, wants to put up this mono Pine Tower, one half mile from the enormous, newly erected Verizon AT&T Sprint Tower with five rings of cells. The purpose is to, chair, char, to charge a lower monthly fee for independent companies in an attempt to wean them away from the existing cell tower down the street. However, Brian Cook of the Tillman Company promoting the T-Mobile Tower said, our community wouldn't benefit from the proposed tower. I don't understand what he put up there, but that's what he said when we, were, when we met with him. Everyone in our neighborhood and the T-Mobile service has voiced com no complaints about the quality of their service. His argument for, the, for this need pertains to rural communities, not suburbs like Carmichael Foothill Farm Area. He failed to say that our property values would drop immediately. Because I live next to the park, about 250 feet from the proposed site, my realtor informed me that the price of my home would drop at least $20,000 from the original quote. She said that the price may go down even more, but we will begin there. Is T-Mobile willing to pay everyone $20,000 or more for their devalued property? I think not. My realtor said that we just have to find somebody for whom an ugly monstrosity just outside my house wouldn't be a problem. The fact that every time they walked out to water their lawn or pull it out of the driveway, it would be in clear view. One would have to look at the ground not to see it. The picture provided by the T-Mobile company makes it look like a shorter than a telephone pole and why, why it looks like a lovely little tree that would enhance its surroundings. Nothing could be further than from the truth. These towers begin as fake trees and turn into regular cell towers cell by cell. They become a mess of fake branches that not even a bird would sit in. It is your duty to protect our communities, not devalue them. The Tillman Company has many other places to put up a tower. Auburn Boulevard runs for miles with plenty of lots that don't back up to a 49-year-old planned community. You wouldn't think of putting this ugly, eventually, when it's finished, 100-foot tower in your front or backyard. The Tillman Company plans to place cell towers nationwide with pro close proximity to existing towers without restrictions and in areas where adequate coverage is already provided. A tower may land in your neighborhood. Unless, of course, you live in Sierra Oaks, Will Hagen, or the fabulous 40s with more doctors, lawyers, and engineers per square acre than other neighborhoods such as ours. Were we more affluent, we would have hired a land use management attorney to plead our case. The CPAC board voted against the tower and were surprised and angered when we informed them that the decision had been overruled by the Sacramento County Planning Commission. The Planning Commission responded that they were setting a new precedent, no longer feeling the need to listen to the CPAC board. This had never happened before, and the board volunteered to pay for and apply for this appeal. 
Sacramento County is amply paid for its approval of a cell tower. The county makes money on every tower that it's installed. And I can only assure that greed is the mo be assured that greed is the motivation. I know that building permits for, for a tower began at $9,014 and that every day of its construction, the county is paid an hourly basis and then they therefore collect revenue thereafter. We haven't even discussed health implications. According to the Telecommunication Act of 1996, 28 years ago, this is a forbidden topic. The FCC was taken to court by the state of Maryland in 2021 to update its standards regarding the long-term dangers to health and the placement of new towers near populations. Having lost the case, it has yet to comply. So here we are left with only aesthetics and physical safety as arguments. Aesthetically speaking, it would be really an ugly an intrusion. Financially, our property values would drop appreciably in terms of health, safety. No insurance company in the United States will insure cell towers due to the fear of tremendous future litigation concerning health problems. Countries around the world, including India, China, Israel, Russia, and Italy, upon learning of cell tower dangers, have created laws to safeguard their people. They know that cell tower radiation can cause cancer and the developmental delay of children. They are, they are 10 to 100 times more stringent in the placement of towers than we are in the United States. The plot for this tower is too small and its height too high according to the minimal FCC rules. I was told that Sacramento County doesn't even follow these rules. How can this be? How can they disregard the well-being of so many? How can you? Please do the right thing in regard to your position as stewards of Sacramento County. You have a sacred trust. It is your job to do right by our community, whose welfare depends on your ruling. Listen to CPAC's decisions. They voted unanimously against this tower. Make your decision with integrity and rule on our behalf and grant our appeal. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Reed. All right, next up. Uh, let's go with uh, Dag Gano. And I've got uh, Regina Wood uh, says for Dag Gano. So did you have is two minutes enough time for you or did you uh, want a little more? Maybe. <laughs> Not sure. Uh, my name's Dag Gano. Uh, I've been sworn. Um, you've been given some misleading information here in the last few minutes. Um, can I do this? Sure. Uh, okay, how do, oh, okay. Where is it? Okay. Yeah, Auburn Boulevard. Auburn Boulevard is ugly. Wouldn't bother me a bit to have that on Auburn Boulevard and fit right in. We don't live on Auburn Boulevard. We live on the other side of this. Where are the pictures of what that thing would look like from our neighborhood? And I guarantee it, none of you, if, if they wanted to do this to your neighborhood, your house, you, you would not be going for it. <laughs> I guarantee it. Um, there is another thing I want to point out here. Um, okay, so Auburn Boulevard is the diagonal road there. If you look in the lower right-hand corner, you see just a little bit of another road. That's Orange Grove Avenue. Orange Grove and Auburn Boulevard converge and they meet at Auburn Boulevard. I don't know if you're familiar with that intersection. It's kind of odd because of the angles. If I leave my house, which is right across the street from the park there, and I drive south, yeah, on uh, River College Drive, 
I hit Orange Grove, I turn right, and as soon as I turn right, until I get to Auburn Boulevard, I am looking directly at an existing cell tower. I, I look at it all the time. I've taken pictures of it because under certain, certain lighting, it looks kind of cool. Um, but, I mean, you're staring at that cell tower. That cell tower is right down the street from where they're proposing this one. And it is, it is surrounded by more industrial type area. Um, the, the idea of putting this thing here, and oh, and, and the, the, the trying to decorate it like a tree, that works up, up a, you know, Donner Summit. I, 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 there's one that I see all the time when I go up there. I go, oh, there's the fake tree. But it blends in. There is not a pine tree. <laughs> anywhere along Auburn Boulevard, and that thing's just going to stick out like a sore thumb. And especially when I come out my front door and I walk out on my driveway, it's going to be right there. You can see the, well, no, you can't. There's trees in the way, but um, yeah, I mean, it's just going to be right there. We have swimming pools. We have kids. We have a playground where kids play. They're going to be I could only guess, 50 feet from that tower, if not less. Everybody who is trying to enjoy the park, they're having a picnic, they're swimming, in the shadow of this thing, and that's another thing. The sun sets in the west, particularly in the summer, which means during the summertime, that's gonna be casting a shadow right across the park and right across the swimming pools. So there's going to be this dark, dark shadow right on top of our park. Um, I, I, I would say any reasonable person who actually physically came to our neighborhood and looked at what's being proposed would just immediately laugh and go, no way. No, it's ridiculous. And it is. It's ridiculous. And that brings me to my last point, and I'll try to hurry. At the last meeting that I came to here. Um, there was somebody sitting over here. I'm assuming these are all staff of the county. Okay. So as taxpayers, we're paying for them. We supply the money through sales tax and property tax and other taxes that pay their salaries. The idea that we have to come here and defend our property against people who are representing this company, essentially, and in fact, at the last meeting, the person that was sitting over here actually said that they were here to represent T-Mobile. And the idea that as a taxpayer, I'm paying for somebody to represent the people who want to damage my property, and they get questions and answers, and they get, you know, and th that's unconscionable. Thank you, Mr. Gunner. You and your process needs to change. That's not okay. Thank you. And I'll be talking to my county supervisor about it. All right, next up we have Terry McIntyre. I'm Terry McIntyre. I have been sworn. Um, a lot of what I was going to say has been said, so I just would like to call your attention to how close this tower will be to Auburn Boulevard. <clears throat> the utility poles and um, power lines are about 45 feet high, and they go right along the Auburn Boulevard on the side, you know, sidewalk. This tower would be set back from Auburn Boulevard about 50 feet, and so it's going to be huge. This property is actually very, very small for this tower. It's, um, it's going to be, uh, I mean, it's not our problem that it's going to be difficult for Tillman to maintain it and to um, conduct their work there, but it's going to be a distraction for the drivers going by on Auburn Boulevard, and especially during the construction and maintenance periods, 
because there will be, um, you know, traffic uh, stops and a lot of distracted drivers. Uh, as Dag pointed out, the the uh, photo simulations are not very accurate for our um, for our views because um, the you know they have the um, 65 or 80 foot tower, but then they're automatically allowed to add 20 feet to that. So they will be twice as tall as the power poles. Um, and um, yeah, the, the property values will go down just because like everyone has said, it's gonna be right there. And so the people coming to buy or rent um, surveys across the nation have shown that people don't want to live near a cell tower. You know, it's, it, depending on where the survey is, it's like 85 to 94 percent of people choose not to do that. And so, of course, property values would go down. And that's all I'll say. Thank, Thank you, you, Ms. McIntyre. Thank you. All right. And then I believe last up we have Dolly Corrado. I'm Dolly Cavetto, and I've been sworn in. Um, last time I was here, I told you all to look at your playgrounds and look at the where your kids play, and they don't want a cell tower overlooking their playground. I'm glad my grandson is now 13, and he's not playing in the playground at the park now. But as, as a little one, he was at our park playing in the playground, which will have that cell tower overlooking it. That, that playground was, I don't know, we paid 30 or $50,000 for it, and not to be used because a cell tower is there. We have two swimming pools. They're putting in pickleball court along with our tennis court. They're right, right next to that cell tower. And I just plead with you county employees and, and your board to really think about it. There's 151 half plexes in our neighborhood. We have a lot of young families coming because we are an affordable place to live. You know, our homes are not f over $500,000. And my next door neighbor just moved because she's a cancer survivor, and they do not want to live by, um, by the cell tower. And there was another neighbor that left also, and they signed the petition. We had, I was out there at 106 degrees, having neighbors sign that petition. And, and we do have a government that works for the people, that's by the people, and I don't think that this cell tower should be approved at all. And I appreciate your time. Thank you so much. All right, we had a lot of notes on the public comment card. So I think I have everyone um, that wanted to speak on the item. I just wanted to check real quick anyone that did not get a chance to speak that would like that opportunity this evening. All right, thank you so much. Uh, with that, we'll go. Oh, did we have one more? Yeah. Did you fill out a public comment card? No. You did. I'm not allowed to speak, am I? Or... If you want to fill one out, yeah, you can come down and speak. Absolutely. And chair, if I, there are no public comments by telephone. Oh, perfect. Okay. And do you have an extra public comment card she could fill out down here, or? I. We'll have you fill it out afterwards. It's okay. Go ahead and state your name and say, I've been sworn. My name is Sharon King, and I affirm I will tell the truth and only the truth. My one concern is I understand that once this has been approved for 80 or 85 feet, that they can come back and raise it to 144 feet without going through this process again. 
This is something I've been told. I haven't verified it, but I would love to know if that's true. Secondly, the setback has been reduced to like 9.7 feet from our fences. And my wondering is, is that from the stem of the tree? So how far does that tree reach out? Is that going to reach over our fence? And that's another question I would love to know. Um, as an ex-teacher, I know in Riverbank, or in Ripon, they had to remove the cell tower that was in the playground yard. Hello, our playground yard, and you're going to put one within nine feet of it. This doesn't make sense. We haven't reviewed the health issues. They're outdated, but you follow the news. You know what's going on. Why aren't they being considered? At the entrance of Auburn, we have freeways going in multiple directions. There's a whole area there where they were planning on expanding this cross-town freeway that's totally unoccupied. Why isn't the cell town going there? Why aren't they talking to the state-owned property to use that? It's right there next to this 140-foot tower that they've just increased over the last few months. And those are things I'd like you to consider. And thank you for your time, and thank you. Thank you. And if you could please fill out a public comment card just so we have your, uh, your name in the record. Ms. King. I, I, oh, I, I was going to do that. Oh, that's fine. Sorry. That's fine. In the wrong direction. Oh, no worries. Thanks for doing that. Thank you so much. All right. So no telephone comments, no one else on Zoom or online? Um, no one on the phone. Perfect. Yes. Uh, with that, we'll go ahead and close public comment. Uh, we will now move on to the rebuttal. Uh, we'll start with the applicant. If you'd like to address any um, concerns brought up in, in public comment, you have the floor. Thank you. Honestly, where do I begin? Um, really, in a nutshell, we really wouldn't be here today if there wasn't a need proven by RF engineering. So we're here building a tower for all of the people in the community that these folks reside in that aren't actually here testifying opposing the project. So, you know, I um, am here to uh, um, answer any questions and I'll leave it at that. Any further questions for the applicant this evening? All right, thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, rebut the rebuttal? You cannot rebut the rebuttal. Uh, uh, we will let the CPAC chair come in and, and uh, also have time for rebuttal. I just want to be clear. Um, T-Mobile has not presented you the circles in which is the coverage area. For example, um, their tower, if, if we drew a circle, how big is that circle, that we can move that circle and see where else this tower could go. They have not provided that documentation, which they could. That's what a signal officer knows how to do. We know that we can move the tower wherever is necessary to achieve the coverage. As for the number of calls, uh, some of the folks in the audience may not understand that there's a limited number of phone, uh, phones that can access a tower at one time. So it's a matter of finding out, okay, what is your, what is your capacity currently? That information was not provided. For example, if the southern tower is over capacity, what about the northern tower, or the eastern tower, or the western tower? There's other ways you can distribute the phone calls, which is really what the issue is. The reason why it, you have an issue is because there is some dead zones in there that do need to be covered, but there are other methods to achieve that and without compromising the safety of the public. Like I said, it is not uncommon for a cell tower to collapse. I believe county, the county staff has said 94 miles an hour is what they had projected the tower to withstand. Uh, Sacramento has had winds above 94 miles an hour, and if it went through that corridor, that tower could collapse. I'm just presenting you know, rare instances, but 
That's why we have setback standards and precedents. And I just encourage you to please follow the precedents and the standards and not deviate from them. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Boyce. Perfect. <laughs> All right. Uh, we've heard a lot of arguments this evening. Um, I, I know many of us are familiar with this project. Um, anyone want to kick us off this evening with their thoughts? Well, can I ask uh, staff uh, a question? Oh, absolutely. Uh, prior to that. Um, so there was a question about uh, the ability to, if approved, automatically raise 20 feet to even almost doubling uh, the size or somewhere in that number. Is, is that a true statement or w can staff address that question, please? Yeah, this is Jessica Brandt. Um, the uh, FCC rule is that once a tower is approved uh, through a local entitlement, um, that the um, owner can then co-locate additional antennas um, uh, up to 20 feet or 20% of the approved height um, by right. So in this case, it would be 20 feet um, is likely what they would end up going with in order to, to add, ta um, add antennas. So it could go then up to 100 feet is what we're hearing, right? It, it could, yes. Um, and so something that was uh, said tonight by the applicant uh, was that um, these have to be built in such a way that others could co-locate at them. Uh, Jessica Brand again. Um, that used to be the case. Um, we are not um, permitted to require that for new towers. Um, and so when we did updates to our zoning code, uh, a few years back that was removed. And so it's not required that a tower be a, a co-location, um, have co-location available. Okay, so that statement then, because based on the coverage maps I saw earlier, um, at 65 feet we would close the gap is, is what I had, if I looked at those maps correctly, and I, I have not done an overlay, but based on my assumptions. So there is no requirement though, because I, I did hear that and I wanted to make sure that that was corrected, so. Um, thank you for correcting that. Thank you for clarifying. Sorry, one more question on that point, on um, the first question. So if we approve at 65, I don't know if we can't even do that because I think it's, oh no, at, at 65, then the applicant can go 20 from there. I know, the, I know what's before us is 80, but. So what, what's before you is 80. Mm -hmm. I, if, you did, if you did approve a 65-foot tower, that would meet the height standard. Um, I, don't, I believe they would still require a special development permit for the separation from a group one zone. Um, so that wouldn't eliminate the special development permit. There's still findings that need to be made for that. Um, and Okay, so they still wouldn't meet the interior property boundary separation or the three to one um, height limit. Um, but uh, yeah, and then it potentially, um, if they did have someone who wanted to bring in more antennas, um, that could be done by right later on okay. and go higher. Yeah. Okay, thanks for the clarification. So I'll, I'll jump in. Um, you know, I, I've been consistent that I, I do believe that um, we need to be aware of access to uh, cell coverage, to making sure that areas um, uh, continue to make sure that there is adequate coverage. Um, that doesn't mean every single, um, I'll say, potential carrier would necessarily be able to oversaturate a neighborhood for that right. I do believe that. Um, knowing this uh, neighborhood and driving it almost uh, weekly, if not more than once a week uh, in that area, um, there are towers, there, there is coverage out there. And so um, 
you know, I do feel that the community has access to adequate cell coverage and care um, when it comes to needing, um, I'll say, uh, access to cellular services and therefore, uh, in some cases, the internet, as that is many ways uh, the only way that some people can afford to get online is through their cell phone uh, and that coverage. So looking at everything there, I do ask the question as to whether or not um, the, I guess, applicant in this case um, truly is, um, did their full due diligence on, uh, on finding locations or being able to cohabitate habitate with others. I mean, at this point, the uh, cell towers nearby um, to attach there would, from what I saw on the maps, uh, at 65 feet or just down the road by, uh, I don't know if it's a quarter mile from there or less than a quarter mile, um, uh, would be able to attach uh, there would fill their gap in coverage um, uh, and meet those needs. So I, I don't know from an aesthetic standpoint and or a location standpoint if it makes sense for us to be approving an 80 foot um, tower right there as, as, as it's the only option. So I, I would be inclined to um, side with the appeal from the CPAC. I think I would be inclined to um, be in a similar camp. I, I, I think I look at the, the, that, that particular lot and um, I think it has some aesthetic challenges already and to place something very not aesthetically pleasing on top of it makes bad even worse um, in my view. Um, you know, I can't speak to the, like, the, the technical needs of cell coverage because that is certainly not my expertise. Um, but the location of the tower aesthetically doesn't, certainly doesn't seem to improve the community. I think I've been consistent with my concerns over our code associated with aesthetics and cell towers. And the origin of this three times the height um, that we have in our code, um, and I've shared my concerns when we have deviated um, from that, but um, I do think that as a county, we should take a look at those standards because we have deviated from them in some cases where the separation of three times um, was probably too large. Uh, in this case, with no trees on the site, with bordering residential, um, with the concerns um, from the aesthetic standpoint, backing up to the residential, I do think um, I definitely land on the side of uh, the CPAC. We're at deliberation now, so I, you've already I, you've had your comments to rebut. So, um, so I think you know really my my concern, or I guess my position has been pretty consistent in that um, these hundred foot towers, just by making them a monopine, does not solve all of our concerns aesthetically. Um, in fact, I think in some cases it may make them worse uh, than a smaller uh, tower that's not a monopine. Um, I just think they stick out like a sore thumb. And unfortunately, I think the county's lean toward, just based on what I've seen, we've leaned toward, oh, you make it a monopine and that solves everything. Um, and that's not, not my view on it. Um, those three findings that are there that allow us to deviate um, essentially give carte blanche to making any site fit, um, and so I think they should be reviewed. Um, but I'm definitely going to uphold them in this case, and that um, th that separation should be there. Commissioner Corona Sabadiano, would you like to weigh in this evening? Um, I, I guess I'm torn because I do, I agree. I think the first, I still remember the first, um, uh, one of these that we had and I had those, you know, the same concerns of, you know, whether it would fall and, uh, the area and over concentration. But I think, um, I, I, I think most of us voted for that one at that time. And so for me, I think I'm just trying to stay consistent 
with my votes, and so I would be supportive of staff recommendation on this one as I was of that one um, that we approved in South, um, I think it was in South Sac. But I, I do agree, I think that there is but, you know, something that we should definitely look at um, going forward and standardizing maybe a little bit more of these applications since they seem to be coming up more and more and more, so. I see some staff discussion over there. Would you guys like to weigh in before one of us takes a stab at a motion? Sure, I'll, I'll start. Um, and Jessica, feel free to chime in as needed. Uh, so we have been, as staff, uh, discussing, uh, not just over here, but in the, the last several months, um, how to handle these types of situations uh, to address some of these issues that you're discussing. Uh, hearing the discussion tonight, it sounds like you're leaning a certain way, and I would actually ask county council to weigh in uh, if it is uh, appropriate, should the uh, planning commission or the board of zoning appeals in this case uphold the appeal, uh, would you like the item to be continued to allow staff time to prepare uh, a summary of the commission's remarks uh, for the basis for? I do think it's a good idea. You're going to need findings. This is the last stop administratively. If either side files suit, you're going to want findings to explain your decision. Um, we have a record here, but not a formalized uh, statement of findings. So, yeah, I think that. As opposed to trying to scribble them out right now um, during the meeting, I'd prefer to, you can have a tentative action, which it sounds like you're ready to do, and then we can continue and come back and you can formalize your action and adopt those findings. I, I hate continuing an item that we want to take an action on. Um, I, I get the idea that we want to do this, but is there no way, because now we're putting all these people that came out here tonight in limbo um, for another time. I, well, I, I just don't see continuing. We, we knew that this could go You should also way. consider that the very first argument that T-Mobile will make in court is you failed to adopt findings, and then they're going to be in even more trouble. So it's probably in the, on the priority ranking, having adopted findings is probably going to be more critical. What do you guys think? As much as I'm also reluctant to ask people to hold on, I think uh, what uh, at least the majority of the of the uh, zoning um, board of appeals is stating right now is that we have a need to list out those findings uh, in reason to, uh, I guess, side with the appeal uh, in in overturning the. Um, uh, administrator's um, decision. So I would uh, I would ask that we make sure that we do this right legally so that um, our efforts, if you will, um, stand. So we, do we think we can get this done in a 10 minute recess? Uh, I'm just, we, we right now, we may not have the same composition up here. It's just, I, I, I hate the idea that we're going to hear something and then we're not going to take an action. Um, I, I would rather. Well, you are. It's like any other continuance. You are going to take an action. Uh, but that's an option uh, t 10 minutes to draft findings. But it's pretty clear we have something, a special development permit that's asking for 80 feet in height, whereas our limit is 65 feet. Our code is very clear in that we need a separation of three times the height of the tower, which would be 240 feet. We're at 100 feet. It's 25 feet setback. All I'm saying is, is we deny the special development permit here. Those three findings. Right. You need findings to address the FCC regulations. So the FCC we regulations um, require the applicant to propose the... An alternative that's the least intrusive is the language, the terminology, in terms of the impacts, and that we're talking about aesthetics mainly. Um, so we have to address in our findings whether or not they've done that, why we think they haven't, why you think they haven't done that. Um, and if, well, we also have to address whether or not there's evidence of available alternatives. Um, it's more than just, and yes, I mean, yeah, they're asking for three exceptions from our standards. 
that are more than just minor exceptions, but you're going to want findings that go um, a bit deeper than that. Okay. I, I lean toward call it a recess. And it, it's not going to matter. If, if Commissioner, um, if Borgia is here next time, um, it's not going to change the three votes. They're so tentatively in favor of granting the appeal. Well, so we can take a vote to grant the appeal tonight and then Tentatively continue. grant the appeal with the only to come back and adopt findings. So unless one of you three decides to change your vote in the interim, it just depends it's not going to change. It will be done by the 22nd meeting or after, because I will be terming off after the 22nd. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, I think there's more things that play into this, right? I, I would rather take action when we hear an item, one way or the other, or else it looks like we're not ready to take action either way. It looks like we're only here because we think action's going to go one way. I think it's disappointing. Could we just take a 10 minute recess and see if we can do it? Just try. Um, well, let's take a 10 minute recess yeah. so we can discuss. Um, so I can have a discussion with staff because I, I think. Well, your discussion should be on the record. Yeah, we, okay. I can't. Yeah, we have to follow that. Um. So I, this is Jessica Brand. I, I do have notes um, from your discussion. Um, I do have uh, Commissioner Tatishi stating that the applicant um, has not demonstrated that there is um, a lack of coverage in the area and a need for additional um, uh, facility. Uh, the uh, tree um, is not aesthetically pleasing. It does not provide adequate screening or stealthing, um, which is another you know, item that the FCC does allow us to look at, whether the screening or stealthing is adequate um, to minimize aesthetic impacts. Um, I don't know, Bill. I had does it meet our design guidelines, Mary? It does. All, all of our, all our design guidelines only require that there's some sort of stealthing. That's the carte blanche rule that Correct. Yeah, sure. we yeah, can violate everything that. as long as we make it a monopole. Yeah. Uh, I think, okay, what I, what I heard from the testimony and what I heard from your deliberation, um, okay, so all your reasons for granting the appeal and correct me if I'm misstating any of them. Um, first, and foremost, first and foremost, they're asking for exceptions from, from our standard requirements, uh, height, distance, separation, and that's the first. It's, it's a code, it's a use permit requirement. So the use permit standard is, is this going to adversely affect the health, safety, welfare of the community? The testimony you've heard is that there's aesthetics um, there is a risk, uh, the testimony from the public is there's a risk that the tower might fall. Um, you don't really have the discretion to make a finding about uh, worries about radiation as long as the applicant can show that the levels that they've measured are within the federal standard, you can't deny on that basis. Um, in terms of the applicant's uh, efforts to show that this is the least intrusive alternative. You've got this exhibit to the staff report and to ta the staff materials. This is exhibit C. I'm sorry, exhibit six, attachment six uh, to the materials. A lot of this is what we saw in the presentation. It shows the service area. It shows uh, a gap in the middle. And then it shows, I guess, fringes of, of service. And then it shows how the 80-foot tower would affect that, how it would close that gap. And it looks to me like expand. But what maybe it doesn't show, um, there were three or four alternative sites for the tower mentioned. Uh, what we heard from the testimony is that's not enough. There are other possible options uh, in that whole service area. Um, whether or not any particular sites, I, I guess I did hear some testimony about particular properties that might um, work as alternative sites. So that would be part of your findings. I'm just talking this out right now. We're going to have to write it down, um, handwrite it, and read it back to everybody. But um, 
The finding would be that this is not the least intrusive proposal, that there are other alternatives within this whole area of a, there's a service gap that are possible. So with that kind of general outline, um, yeah, I can huddle with planning staff and we can kind of bullet point what the findings would be, come back and read them back and you can let us know if that accurately reflects what your rationale is for the three of you. Sounds like a plan to me. Does that work? Recess? Yep. 10 minute recess. Thank you all. Maybe 15. So we're going to go ahead and reconvene the Planning Commission. And I'll turn it over to uh, staff for the proposed findings. All right. Thank you all for your patience. Uh, we have drafted some findings for the uh, Board of Zoning Appeals consideration. I'm just going to read them. Uh, and what's that? Um, I'm just going to read them and you can interject as necessary. Thank you. You, you let us know if this accurately reflects, the three of you, uh, your reasons for uh, granting the appeal. All right. Uh, so number one, uh, the project results in aesthetic impacts in that the proposed tower would be stark, prominent, and intrusive to the adjacent residential neighborhood located 100 feet to the east. That includes outdoor recreation facilities used by neighborhood residents. Number two. Are, are you including the outdoor residents or outdoor facilities? Because it's also homes that are there, right? That is do we, true. Do we need to add in there residential homes also? Sure. Done. Thank you. Number two, the requested deviations from height and setback requirements are significant. True. Number Agreed. three, visual simulations failed to demonstrate aesthetic impacts were reduced from the perspective of the adjacent residential neighborhood. Sounds good. Number four. The use of stealth design will not minimize nuisance impacts from the proposed wireless communication facility. Therefore, the establishment, maintenance, or operation of the structure applied for will, under the circumstances, be detrimental to the health, safety, peace, morals, comfort, or general welfare of persons residing or working in the neighborhood or be detrimental or injurious to property and improvements in the neighborhood or to the general welfare of the county. I almost said those exact same words when I was deliberating, but yeah, thank Let's, you. Can we say and? The first time you get to general welfare, and instead of or. Yes. Any other changes on that one? No. Okay. Um, number five, applicant did not demonstrate that the additional height was necessary to achieve their coverage objectives. Okay. Number six, Public testimony included potential alternative locations that were not explored in the applicant's alternative site analysis, which only included four alternative sites. Number seven, the applicant has not demonstrated that the proposed project is the least intrusive means to provide the desired improved coverage. And number eight, the applicant's grounds for infeasibility at the alternative sites was insubstantial and conclusory. 
Yeah. Okay. That Works for me. Includes my draft findings, our draft findings. Okay. Thank you all for doing that. Anything that we missed? I think that summarizes what we were thinking, or I was thinking. All right, um, I'll make a motion to uphold the appeal uh, with those draft findings read into the record. Second. Any further deliberation? Please call the roll. Commissioners Rachel. Yes. Corona Sabignano. Uh, no. I'm sorry, I didn't catch that. No. Okay. Uh, Tatishi? Yes. And Devlin? Yes. And the motion uh, carries with those member pre members present. Um. Thank you. That uh, concludes our Board of Zoning Appeals. Uh, we'll move on now to the Planning Director's Report. So who was the second on that, Tatishi? Uh, good evening, Commissioners. I don't have much of a report tonight. Um, I'll let Jessica speak to upcoming agenda items. Uh, thank you. So uh, I unfortunately don't have my agenda up, but uh, <laughs> it's okay. Um, the uh, next meeting, uh, we do have a couple of items on the agenda, um, and I believe it's Commissioner Titishi's last meeting. Um, do I have anyone who knows that they will not be in attendance in two weeks? Okay. Um, thank you. And then um, the, uh, so that's the 22nd, the 5th. Um, we do have a couple of items on the 5th as well. Uh, February 5th, anyone expecting to be absent on February 5th? other than Commissioner Tatishi. <laughs> um, and then the 26th, um, we are expecting uh, a controversial item um, coming on the 26th. Um, that's the Jesuit High School Stadium Lighting. Um, that will be a packed house. Um, so I just wanted to give a heads up for the February 26th agenda on that. Uh, we do have a couple of other items on that agenda as well. And that's it for scheduling. Thank you. What, what, really quickly, so mm -hmm. February 5th and the 26th? It should be 12th, right? And 26th? Um, I believe the 12th is a holiday. Yeah, it's the 5th and 26th. It's the 5th and it's 26th. It's a county holiday. Yeah. You still take Lincoln's birthday. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. Good to know. I'll update that in my calendar. Perfect. All right. Uh, that leads us to um, general public comments. And there are no further public comments. Thank you so much. Commissioners, anything to add before we adjourn? All right. Thank you so much. Have a great night, everybody. We're adjourned at 9.01.